Now, my message here today essentially is, is that ISDS is constantly evolving. It continues to evolve. And I'm convinced that it evolves in favor of more balanced investment treaties that recognize things like human rights. Now, it's common, commonly held that the first bit was in 1959. I don't, I don't deny that, but I do want to uh, let you know that as part of the Marshall Plan after World War II, there was a provision in that economic plan that, that required essentially ISDS for American firms that were investing in post-war Germany. Uh, the, uh, the states had to agree to permit them to submit to arbitration in the case of a dispute uh, between uh, Germany and the investors. It's very similar in sound to, to the ISDS system, but it is that long ago that, uh, that America certainly was thinking about this as a way to resolve disputes between US investors and foreign countries. Now, while it's evolving, and it's uh, evolving in a way I think that does favor human rights, I don't want to suggest that it's perfect by any means, especially after listening to uh, Professor Dreyfus and Professor Frankel this morning. Uh, I wouldn't be that foolish. But I do think that the evolution is there, and it's, and it's, and it's, uh, it's um, readily apparent. So I want us to talk about uh, ISDS in, in, from a historical perspective to, so that we can all kind of uh, lodge ourselves in, in what the system is was intended to be, how it's evolved, because it's, it's important for this, this debate and this discussion. Uh, it's easy to forget because ISDS has been around uh, for since you know, 1959, formally, I guess, uh, that uh, it was designed or meant to be to replace or to be a more efficient replacement for uh, an existing, existing set of rules of international law, and that is the law of diplomatic protection. Now, it's important to recognize also that the law of diplomatic protection was, it worked well enough in the context of investment disputes to have dominated the area for about 200 years. Um, it was and is, uh, well, it was a product of its time in the sense that it was a time when people viewed international law as regulating relations between states themselves, not between states and private citizens. So under the law of diplomatic protection, and uh, as Tim would know as well, uh, what happens is essentially if, if a US investor goes abroad, let's say to France, and uh, their, uh, France takes their investment without, uh, without uh, paying them compensation, a di an internationally wrongful act, under the law of diplomatic protection, that investor's only uh, uh, recourse was to go back to uh, the State Department and say, I've been wronged by France. Uh, the US, the State Department will look at it carefully, determine whether there has been a, an internationally wrongful act. If there has been, and there's the political will, that's a very important thing, uh, then they will pursue France directly on a state-to-state -state basis. Now, and they would seek reparations. So from the state's perspective over time, that had, had some problems. I can tell you, we, it, it's still done in the State Department because where, where treaties don't cover wrongs, you still have diplomatic protection. Uh, we still have it in mass claims in particular as well. So when I was at the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission, there was a two, 2008 uh, settlement with Libya for victims, US victims of terrorism. And uh, in, in uh, two, two years later, 2010, a settlement with Iraq for U.S. victims of Saddam Hussein. Those were settled in the classical uh, diplomatic protection way. Now, from this, from the, so, so it takes a lot of time on the part of the, of the state and the, and the State Department. And when that was the only game in town, it took up a lot, an extra a lot of time. So it was not, it was kind of, it, it was a pain. And also, it was an irritant. It tended, they tended to be irritants in the relationships between states. So from the investor's perspective, it was highly uh, uh, in, uh, not satisfactory. The, the, the investor lost control of their claim. 
it, it now is taken by the U.S. and pursued with the foreign government. If successful, the U.S. wasn't obliged to pay the, uh, the investor. Under the law, the U.S. was entitled to keep it. Even if this, the U.S. decided not to keep it, they would keep an administrative fee. And sometimes that was the whole award uh, at the end of it all. So it's out of this that, that the ISDS system arose. Um, and it was designed to prevent these kinds of shortcomings. And the key to it was that private parties under the system can bring claims directly against foreign states. So you take out the host state out of it once that the agreement is reached. So the workhorse of the ISDS system are the treaties between states that define and describe the reciprocal rights and obligations vis-a-vis -vis each other and their investors. They come in various forms. There's between two states, bilateral investment treaties, between uh, more than two multilateral investment treaties, and then, as we talked about uh, earlier, uh, when you have a, a trade investment agreement, uh, the chapters on investment of these multilateral arrangements also count as, as ISDS. Um, right now, uh, on the, I think there was a, um, an OECD report that came out earlier this month, there are approximately 2,200 uh, bits or multilateral investment treaties in force. There have been over, as uh, Jason indicated, well over 3,000 uh, 3, um, in, in, in over the, the history of it. So they do cover uh, a global landscape, although it's not a complete coverage. Now, to the question that uh, Professor Jure raised this morning, which is why, with all of the problems that we hear about, why do states do enter into these agreements? Well, there are a variety of reasons. So a fundamental one is that for states that want to export investment to, to promote the ability of their citizens to invest into foreign countries with some guarantees that these investments of their citizens will be properly treated in those foreign countries. Now, these kinds of states have what we call outbound or offensive interests when they negotiate the treaties. And put simply, that means that they look to protect their citizens as much as possible via the investment treaty. And these were the states that started the whole process. As you heard, Germany, uh, the first one with Pakistan uh, in 1959, followed shortly thereafter by the, uh, Germany and the Dominican Republic. Now, a second main motivation for entering into investment treaties is for states that want to attract investment. These states can demonstrate a safe environment for foreign investment by signing up to bits that require them to adhere to certain standards of treatment. Now, here is where it gets tricky. These investment-seeking states, usually left less developed economies than those of the investment-exporting states, historically have not had a lot of leverage in negotiating bits, to say the least. And so they have generally simply accepted the offensively-minded bits that have been offered by countries like the United States. Now, I want to make it clear that I personally don't believe that, bets are, that bits are necessary to attract foreign investment. I believe that the rate of return on an investment is a much better indicator of whether or not a company is going to invest overseas. And in my experience, investors are willing to take huge risks to try to capture large rates of return. But that's another topic, but I think it's relevant here now, nonetheless, the notion that bits are attractive is common currency. And developing states have been pushed to enter into them since, since the, the programs began. And the problem is, is that these bits then usually turn out to be lopsided in favor of the developed states. Now, I recognize that the rights and obligations in investment treaties are reciprocal between the state parties. Nonetheless, the result in these situations is that there is an asymmetrical impact of legal and regulatory constraints when one party is an investment exporter and the other is an investment importer. 
the, asymm the asymmetry is multiplied, in my view, when the less developed, uh, the inv uh, when, the, when the country is l least developed. So the, the less developed it is, the more that asymmetrical impact is seen. So let me just stop here for a moment to underline the dynamics of the system. States with offensive goals for their BIT programs sought to ensure a stable investment environment for their citizen investors abroad. They sought rock solid treaty-based guarantees that the rights of their own investors are preserved, including what we would consider to be human rights, such as the rights to access to justice and the right to compensation in the event of an expropriation. So we can't forget that human rights protection goes in this direction also in the ISDS regime. Now at the same time, however, the effect of this approach by investment exporting states to their investment seeking counterparty is to constrain that state's ability to adjust their legal and regulatory environment with respect to that new investment, even if it meant that they were unable to implement their own human rights obligations. Now, in my view, that's the basic dynamic of the system. And we can't forget, as we talk about it, that this system is created or was created and maintained and is maintained by the will of the states, not the will of investors. What investors have done with the help of their lawyers, undoubtedly, has been to expand protections ways beyond perhaps what even exporting states anticipated or envisioned. Now, in terms of the human rights aspects of things, the good news is, is that the basic dynamic is not set in stone. Many states, like the United States, started out as investment exporters with an offensive approach to negotiating bids. As the prospect of investment inflows became apparent, the US has modulated its stance to incorporate defensive positions that are guaranteed or designed to protect their interests as a state in, its, in, their, in the freedom to regulate. So taking the United States example, I want to show how the system has evolved towards a much more balanced regime and particularly into the area of preserving states' abilities to regulate in favor of human rights and social, uh, social rights. Now, the US negotiates bits on the basis of a model, and a model that is developed through a very rigorous process, interagency inter uh, uh, negotiations that get very heated, uh, intra-governmental intra processes and negotiations that are also even more heated. So, uh, within the executive, there are uh, lots of debates before it even goes out outside the, uh, the executive itself. Um, this program began in 1977, and the U.S. completed its first model bit in 1981. Now, this was largely focused on European bits with developing countries that had been in place since the late 1950s. So I said uh, Ger Germany with Pakistan and then uh, Dominican Republic. Well, the US first bit was, uh, was in 1982 with Panama. And again, this is all highly developed countries against uh, or with, uh, with uh, less developed countries. Now, there were several d developments of the, or revisions of the model bit in the 1980s. But at this time, the US model bit was distinctly offensive in nature. And we can tell that by looking at the, at the substantive protections that were contained in those bits and the carve-outs that allow for regulatory movement. So, let's see if I can figure this out. Oh, there we go, yeah. So looking at those early, early bits, we see provisions that uh, g give the investor the better of national treatment or most favored nation treatment for the full life cycle of the investment. This means that the investors are entitled to be treated as favorably as the host party treats its own investors or as the host party treats any third party investor. The right to an effective means of asserting claims locally. And a violation of that commitment leads to a bit claim. 
Uh, there's, uh, the investors have a treaty-based commitment to accord fair and equitable treatment to U.S. investors. In other words, this is treatment greater than that afforded to uh, what the law of uh, customary international law of fair and equitable treatment is. And as many of us have spoken today, uh, that's a particularly difficult uh, standard in terms of interpretation and application. An umbrella clause that requires each state to, to observe any obligations it has assumed with respect to investors of other states. So this is designed to be a kind of a catch-all for investors. And it can, for example, convert what might be a contract claim to a bit claim. Um, there are clear limits on expropriation of investments and provisions for payment, uh, prompt and adequate uh, in, in uh, uh, currency. Um, the investor can make quick transfers of money out of the host country without delay and using market rates. It limits the use of so-called trade distorting performance requirements such as local content rules or export quotas. Uh, the, the investors have the right to engage top managerial personnel of their, of their choice, regardless of nationality. And when we look at the carve-outs, there's only one, and that is the essential, the essential security exception. This permitted the United States and its bit partners to take measures necessary for the fulfillment of their national obligations with respect to the protection of their own essential security interests. Now, significantly at this time, uh, the definition of what was an essential security interest was determined not by the parties, but by uh, arbitrators if, uh, if it went to an arbitration. So when you add these up and assess the investment protections in the relatively narrow carve-out, it's clear that these early model bits were uh, aggressive in terms of protecting investors, not so much the, the state's ability to, to regulate. Now, the major shift into the other direction came when the United States was considering an agreement with other sophisticated economies, and that's the NAFTA. So Canada, certainly uh, Mexico, less sophisticated, but certainly uh, was going to invest into the United States after, after NAFTA. And this uh, it was, it was, came into force in 1993. Now, Chapter 11 of the NAFTA contains the dispute resolution, the investor investment provisions and dispute resolution provisions, and it marked a distinct shift in the U.S. bid program to bids that better balance the need to protect investors abroad, but also to protect the, the government's ability to regulate. Now, that inflow of capital did happen, and it was it was uh, extremely large. So. The, the outcome was that having prepared for it and having moderated or modulated its, its bits in the form of the NAFTA, the U.S. was better able to address and handle the inevitable investor state arbitration claims that were going to come because of that increased investment. And that's, that's in fact what happened. So again, let's take a look at the, this, to see the difference. So again, we had the early model bits with all of these protections and only one carve out. And then you go to uh, post NAFTA. And here we have, we've taken out the, um, um, the umbrella clause, for example, uh, the, the right to a local remedy. Um, and then it added all of these exceptions and carve outs. And it, again, these exceptions and carve outs are designed to create space to regulate. So here we have uh, the essential security exception, as I mentioned in the earlier bits, were, was to be determined by, by arbitra arbitrators. Now in the NAFTA, it's self-judging. Uh, it says, nothing in this treaty shall be constru construed to preclude a party from applying measures that it considers necessary a big change. We also have now the prudential exception with regard to financial services. It provides that a party shall not be prevented from adopting or maintaining measures relating to financial services for prudential reasons, including for the protection of investors, depositors, policyholders, etc., or to ensure the integrity of the financial system. 
with a monetary exception that says nothing uh, in this treaty applies to non-discriminatory measures of general application taken by any public entity in pursuit of monetary and related credit policies or exchange rate policies. Now, right now, um, the government of Croatia has a number of huge investment treaty claims against it for having devalued its currency uh, from the uh, breaking the connection with the Swiss franc. Um, if they had this clause, there might not have been those claims. So, um, Importantly, uh, there's others here, but, but I want to focus on uh, the provisions relating to the investment uh, and the environment that give the government discretion to act notwithstanding uh, other commitments. So Article 12.2 of the model uh, states that the parties recognize that each party retains the right to exercise discretion with respect to regulatory compliance, investigatory and prosecutorial matters, and to make decisions uh, regarding the allocation of resources to other environmental matters determined to have higher priorities by the government. So that's a, a big change from before. Similar is, uh, is, the, is the Article 13 on investment and labor, um, which requires the states not to lower their, their standards, their labor standards. Um, and the, the, these provisions do echo certainly uh, basic human rights here which include the right to regulate initiatives, including the abolition of child labor and all forced labor, discrimination, and things like acceptable work conditions. So seen in this historical light, it seems to me that the US BIT program is fairly dramatic in terms of how it has carved out regulatory space over the years, uh, by, simply by virtue of, of the threat of inward, in, inbound, uh, inv increased inbound investment, and therefore greater risk of, of being uh, taken to arbitration. Now, I want to uh, you know, recognize that there are other very powerful forces at play that have uh, 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 mandated change in the ISDS system. Now, these include increased unilateralism, which is reflected in the U.S. negotiating position in the current NAFTA 2.0 uh, uh, negotiations. And in my view, uh, this is the greatest danger to the ISDS the system, the greatest single danger that the system faces. Other forces include numerous satisfactions with the system, including, uh, just by way of example, lack of accountability on the part of the arbitrators. They don't, uh, they don't account to any uh, electorate. Um, the shock, and, and shock is not uh, um, overstating it, the shock of huge awards against states, it cannot be overestimated. Canada has been hit hard, as had, had Europe, but particular Eastern Europe. And one case that always stands out in my mind is an early case against the Czech Republic where there was an award uh, that uh, was about equal to uh, or a substantial portion of the Czech Republic's annual public health budget. We all know the case uh, the Argentina have gone through and uh, the Venezuela saga continues. Now finally, and I think this is very significant too, developing countries are increasingly rejecting the common wisdom that bits are necessary to attract foreign direct investment. So in many ways, we can see a significant number of the pressures that are on the uh, human rights, uh, sorry, or that are on the ISDS system, at least come around the human rights issues. And uh, maybe, uh, Professor Land, this is an example of um, human rights breaking down the ISDS house, or, or at least you know, putting some bruises on it. Um, but in the face of this additional criticism, uh, I've only talked about the US model bit. Uh, others have gone f still further. And uh, I, I want to mention briefly, um, uh, the CETA, the Comprehensive uh, Econo Economic and Trade Agreement between Canada and, and, and the EU. Uh, it's been talked about a lot today. 
Um, but I'll say two things about it. Uh, first, it was remarkable to me how often the phrase for greater certainty appears in that, in that document. Now, when you couple this with the provision of an appellate tribunal, it, it's, it's an unmistakable signal to the first instance arbitrators about how the state parties expect the provisions of the agreement to be interpreted. So it's like a carrot and a, and a stick. And second, the provision that requires regular review of the content of the protections, such as fair and equitable treatment, is a further chill in my view on the prospect of runaway tribunals. Now, as a final wrap up, I want to refer everybody to a, a bit uh, between Morocco and Nigeria in December 2016. It's not yet in force, but it was signed uh, between uh, two developing countries uh, in December of 2016. And it's an interesting model of what the bit world might look like if you didn't have an asymmetry between, uh, between the state's parties. It includes many provisions that are designed to preserve the ability of the states to regulate, including in Article 23, a provision entitled the right of states to regulate. Article 15 has investment, labor, and human rights provisions. And the most interesting article, in my, my view, uh, is, is, is Article 14, I believe, that requires investors to undertake and comply with environmental assessment and social impact assessments prior to the establishment of the investment. So looking to, to ensure that the social impact or the environmental impact on a particular investment does not put a burden on the state. So with that, let me conclude by saying that the, the system is not perfect. Uh, it, uh, it comes out of history with a particular uh, design, uh, but that design is clearly changing uh, and changing fairly dramatically and will continue to change unless it all blows up. So thank you. <laughs>